This week, Fitch Ratings, one of the big three American credit rating agencies, lowered the long-term default rating of the United States to AA+, or one notch below the top AAA grade. Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, called the move arbitrary and based on outdated data, and says she strongly disagreed with it. Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary under Clinton, called Fitch's move bizarre and inept. The Biden campaign is already calling it the Trump downgrade, the result of what it describes as an extreme MAGA Republican agenda defined by chaos, callousness, and recklessness. What's going on here? Is Fitch's decision justified? Why did he choose this time of all times to make the move? Is it the tail wagging the dog or a harbinger of what's to come? Does it matter? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about the big story shaping our world tomorrow. Fitch is not the first major rating agency to strip the US of its AAA credit rating. Standard & Poor's did the same in 2011. In both cases, the decision to cut the US credit rating came about after partisan brinksmanship in Washington over the debt ceiling that heightened the risk of a potential US default. Just like Standard & Poor's 12 years ago, Fitch justified its latest decision on what it called an erosion of governance. What is erosion of governance? In its statement accompanying the rating action, Fitch listed the political standoff over the debt ceiling and the absence of a medium-term fiscal framework. But these are not new. Indeed, ever since 2013, Fitch has been warning that it might cut the US credit rating. So why did it wait so long before finally pulling the trigger? I don't know. But I'm willing to venture a guess. Downgrading the most powerful country in the world is a risky affair. Standard & Poor's had come under sharp attacks from both Democrats and Republicans for its decision to downgrade the US. Tim Geithner, the US Treasury Secretary under Obama, said at the time that S&P had shown terrible judgment and handled themselves poorly. The filmmaker Michael Moore publicly demanded Obama to have the head of S&P arrested, no less. Against growing political backlash, the CEO of S&P resigned 18 days after the downgrade. I'm going to assume that Paul Taylor, the CEO of Fitch, likes his job and wants to hang on to it. If I'm right, then it's reasonable to think that the decision to downgrade the US would have gone through an exhaustive process of analysis and deliberation by Fitch. Everyone at Fitch involved in the decision would have known that their careers were on the line. Jenna Yellen may be calling the decision arbitrary, but I suspect it was anything but arbitrary. I'm going to explain in this video why the downgrade is important and why it could not have come at a better time. In a video earlier this year, I called the debt ceiling America's necessary evil. Because the US dollar is the world's primary reserve currency, the US can get away with policies that are ruinous for lesser countries. Put differently, the actions of the US government are not subject to the same market discipline as those of most other countries. This became even more true during the era of quantitative easing when the US government was seldom subject to any market discipline at all. The aggressive bond buying by the Federal Reserve during QE crushed and finished off the last bond vigilantes. What this means is that for all practical purposes, the debt ceiling is the only American institution that is still keeping fiscal sanity alive in Washington. This is because raising the debt ceiling requires majority support in both houses of Congress. This critical feature of the debt ceiling gives leverage to the minority in Washington that still believes in fiscal responsibility. During the 2011 debt ceiling crisis, this minority was the Tea Party, the fiscal conservative movement founded in 2009 that picked up five Senate seats and 40 House seats in the 2010 midterm elections. 
In 2011, the brinksmanship over the debt ceiling between Obama and the Republicans energized by the Tea Party led to an agreement that cut spending by $917 billion in exchange for an increase in the debt ceiling by $900 billion. The deal helped stabilize the U.S. public debt as a percentage of GDP at about 100% for the next eight years. No doubt, the fiscal tightening that happened after 2011 would never have come about without the debt ceiling fight that nearly brought the U.S. to the edge of default. Sure, the 2011 debt ceiling fight was not pretty to watch, but it worked. And it bought time for the U.S. economy, not to mention the U.S. dollar. The fact that more good than bad came out of the 2011 debt ceiling fight is why the 2023 debt ceiling fight was such a letdown. Massive increases in government spending under Biden have placed the U.S. on an unsustainable debt trajectory. The Republican Party that had regained control of the House of Representatives last November promised that it would use any means to rein in out-of-control government spending. But Kevin McCarthy, the Republican House Speaker, caved under pressure at the end of a long-drawn fight over the debt ceiling. The deal reached does very little more than capping the 2024 spending level at the very high 2023 level. The 2023 debt ceiling crisis already has a Wikipedia page. It made a lot of scary noise, but in the end, it was all for nothing. It was in the end, nothing more than political theater. What it tells me is that America's last and only guardrail for fiscal sanity may be dead. Polls show that fiscal deficit and federal debt are not even the top 10 of concerns among Americans these days. Even immigration and crime rank higher. Feel free to disagree, but I think as the U.S. becomes more polarized politically, fiscal responsibility is becoming less and less important for voters, and fewer and fewer politicians are prepared to use the political capital to fight for it. Fitch will never admit it, of course, but I wonder if Fitch has come to the same conclusion. A clue is that Fitch apparently told U.S. Treasury officials at meetings that the January 6th riot had played a role in their decision. I suspect what they meant is the fallout from the extreme polarization that has gripped America in recent years. I get it. Fitch gets it too, apparently. I wonder how many people on Wall Street or Main Street understand what this really means for inflation, for the economy, for the bond market, not to mention the future of the U.S. dollar. I'm surprised that not more people on Wall Street are as amazed as I am by the fact that the U.S. budget deficit is higher this year than last year. Government budget or fiscal balance is typically countercyclical. What this means is that during economic expansions, the budget balance usually improves and during recessions, it deteriorates. The reasoning is simple. During expansions, the government collects more taxes and makes less welfare payments. During recessions, the opposite is true. With the U.S. economy growing above 2% and the unemployment rate at 3.6%, the U.S. economy is clearly not in a recession right now. Yet, incredibly, the U.S. budget balance is getting worse rather than getting better. Fitch forecasts that the U.S. budget deficit will reach 6.3% of GDP this year, up from 3.7% last year. The IMF forecasts that the U.S. cyclically adjusted primary balance as a share of potential GDP will reach 4.1% this year, just behind Japan, Russia, and China. If the U.S. economy is running such a big deficit during expansion, what will happen when it goes into a recession? We could easily see 8% or even 10% budget deficit in an average recession. Over the past two years, debt-to-GDP ratio has been suppressed by the surge in inflation that boosted the denominator in the ratio. In a recession, debt dynamics could turn ugly quickly as inflation falls. In other words, America's high fiscal deficit today is a ticking time bomb.
The US economy has defied pessimists and grown faster this year than most people expected. If you've been following my videos, you would know that I was not in the recession camp. For one thing, I was less concerned about the impact of the US regional bank crisis. Another reason why I've been more positive on the US economy is the reshoring of jobs back to the US from China that is boosting US manufacturing and the supporting industries. My third reason is the fiscal easing. As you can see on this chart, in the first six months of the year, government outlays grew 15% following an increase of 14% in the second half of last year. 15% means government spending has grown faster than the overall growth of the economy. Much faster. Part of this increase is due to increased interest payments. Part of the increase is going into people's pockets. Since the start of the year, net government social benefits to persons grew almost as fast as compensation of employees. Part of the increase went to growing the size of the government. The US government added 400,000 people to its payrolls in the last six months, the most of any sector of the economy and by far. But the deterioration of the deficit also reflects new business incentives and tax credit to promote Biden's energy security and climate change priorities. Federal government receipts fell 14% in the first half of this year. What I'm trying to say is that if the U.S. economy had done well this year, it was in large part thanks to a significant loosening of fiscal policy. But this fiscal year is over in two months. In the next fiscal year, government spending is capped under the debt ceiling agreement. This means fiscal policy will soon offer little help to the economy. Just when the impact of interest rate hikes on the economy will start to be felt more keenly, when many more corporate and personal loans will have to be refinanced. Fitch's decision to downgrade the US is well-timed. It comes ahead of another potentially bruising fiscal fight in September, this time on how the spending for next year will be allocated. The Fitch downgrade might help bolster the fiscal hawks in the Republican ranks. My money is on another government shutdown. This fight is important because it may be the last chance on the political calendar over the next three years for the U.S. to do something about the runaway fiscal train. As for the investment implications and strategy, I will discuss in the next Beat the Market video to come out on Sunday. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.